Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Wel welcome back to the Andy Jones School of Social Science. Tonight we have the pleasure of, uh, the pleasure and honor, I should add, to uh, invite one of the winners of our 2024 Henry George School uh, writing contest. We do this every year and we have two great winners. And uh, I think they are all here, but we will have them on a row. So tonight is gonna be Paul's turn and he's gonna talk to us about uh, uh, original acquisition, comparing and contrasting Henry George and John Locke. So Paul is a PhD student uh, at uh, uh, the Department of Philosophy at Yale University. And he's working on uh, how on institutions that make cooperation possible. So he's a man on a crusade on finding out not just how to grow the economy, but also to grow the pie, but also to find ways of distributing in a fair way. So what can be more joyous than that? With that, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, likewise, it's an honor to be here and I'm happy to uh, present my work to this audience. Um, so I have some slides that I'd like to share. Uh, let me see if I can pull those up. All right, well, um, I'll just get started then. Uh, so my understanding is we have an hour today uh, and I'd like to spend about half of that time uh, presenting my paper and then I'd like to have a discussion uh, about these issues uh, afterwards. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, my paper is called Locke and George on Original Acquisition, and uh, what it does is it looks at, I think, two paradigm views about uh, property rights and how natural resources ought to be distributed in society, and compares them and ultimately argues that the George's view is better than the Lockean view. Um, as far as I'm aware, George never read Locke and never uh, put his views into conversation uh, with Locke explicitly. So this is my, sort of my attempt to do so on his behalf, uh, because I think there's a lot that can be learned by um, uh, examining these two views side by side. So uh, I'm going to start my uh, presentation tonight by looking at uh, Locke's view. Uh, I expect that many of the people in the audience will have some familiarity with this view, but I'll just start by um, uh, reminding everyone of some of the basic details uh, of this view. So. Uh, Locke's basic idea is that uh, we start with self-ownership. Every moral agent uh, has an entitlement over their own person and their own labor and their own body. Uh, and that's a commitment that George shares. Um, and what's more, Locke and George both think that uh, all entitlements start with self-ownership. Uh, and self-ownership generates all other entitlements to property rights that exist. But they draw uh, quite different conclusions from this fundamental premise of self-ownership, as we'll see. Locke thinks that there is a solid argument that derives uh, strong rights over natural resources from the self-ownership of people who improve those resources. Uh, but George thinks that this connection doesn't hold. Indeed, George thinks that um, strong property rights, private property rights over natural resources are inconsistent with self-ownership rather than following from self-ownership as Locke thinks. So in what follows, I'm gonna to try to articulate that contrast as best I can. Uh, so as I just mentioned, Locke thinks that uh, um, improvers who uh, add value to natural resources, whether it's by digging canals or building a house or clearing a forest, uh, any of these things improve natural resources. And if you uh, undertake the hard work of improving a natural resource, then you should be compensated, Locke thinks, uh, obviously enough. And he thinks that that improvement is what generates your entitlement to the improved natural resource as a whole. What Locke doesn't see is that um, we can clearly separate the value of natural resources into two components. Uh, the value of the improvement that's added by people on the one hand and the value that inheres in the natural resource independent of the improvements to that particular resource on the other hand. And it, I think it's Locke's failure to see the distinction between these two sources of value for improved natural resources that gives uh, rise to some of the difficulties for his view. Um, <clears throat> and I'll get to that uh, in a moment. 
I just want to remind you of one final uh, feature of Locke's view, and that's that there are two important provisos uh, in his account of natural resources. Uh, first, improvers get rights to natural resources only if there's enough and is good for others. So other people have to have the opportunity to um, have access to natural resources and work on them as well <clears throat> in order for the strong suite of property rights um, that follow from labor to be possessed by the improver. <clears throat> and second, uh, there must not be any waste. So Locke doesn't think that you can take a bunch of natural resources for yourselves, uh, for yourself, for instance, by harvesting all of the apples from an apple tree. If you're just going to let those some of those apples waste and rot away, um, there's no justification for private appropriation of resources when those resources are wasted. That is when they're not um, obtaining their highest and best use. And that's a concept that I'll come back to later in the talk. <clears throat> uh, so what, just one word before we move on about the context of this uh, theory of acquisition. Locke was writing about two centuries before George and in a very different social context. So Locke was, uh, among other things, a colonial administrator who helped uh, enshrine slavery in the constitution of the Carolina colony. Um, and there's been a lot of scholarly debate in recent decades about the connection between Locke's view of property and his role as a colonial administrator. And, but unfortunately, I won't be able to get into the details of that debate in this talk. Um, his view also comes out of the context of uh, agricultural reforms, such as the enclosure movements that were happening in England in the early modern period. So this is very different from uh, the context in which George is writing two centuries later. <laughs> So now let's move on to uh, my George's critique of uh, Locke's view of appropriation. So as I mentioned before, George agrees that self-ownership uh, um, is the ultimate ground of all entitlements, but he shows that exclusive rights to possess natural resources are actually inconsistent with self-ownership rather than following from self-ownership. Um, in particular, I think what George allows us to see is that the most that the labor mixing argument shows uh, from Locke is that laborers are entitled to the value of their improvements, uh, but they're not entitled to the value of natural resources. And that's because the value of both of those components get determined in different ways. So uh, the value of a natural resource is determined by uh, what, recall, what Ricardo called the law of rent. Um, and uh, the idea here is that the value of resources themselves is purely a scarcity rent. So um, resources are more valuable to the extent that there are more people and more productive uses for resources. Another way of putting this is that resource value is entirely extrinsic from the, with respect to the efforts of the improver. So um, if you own a lot in a city with a house on it, um, your, uh, your house can, the lot plus the house can go up in value over time. But that's not because the house is improving in value. That's because the land itself is improving in value because more people are moving to the city and the economy in the city is growing. Uh, we know that the, the value of your house itself doesn't increase because houses gradually depreciate with wear and tear and exposure to the elements over time. Uh, so that's the depreciating component of real estate. Um, and so we can sort of see now how improvement value and land value are determined in two different ways. Only one of them, only improvement values, due explicitly to the efforts of individual people, individual improvers. Natural resource value, on the other hand, is due to uh, the scarcity rent that's determined by global features of the economic arrangement, such as what the aggregate demand is and what the aggregate supply is. And of course, as we all know, for natural resources, the supply is fixed and independent of anything that we can do. Um, so that's why I think that um, George allows us to easily see why uh, the labor mixing argument just shows that we're entitled to the value of the improvements we make to natural resources uh, rather than uh, the, the value of the natural resources themselves, the things that we labor upon. And so that's the basic outline of George's um, justice-based argument for uh, a land value tax. Um, taken not just to include taxes on uh, urban and suburban residential land, but also um, for things like 
um, uh, uh, severance taxes on oil and gas, for instance, and a number of other natural resources. Um, of course, as many of you know, there's also efficiency arguments for a land value tax. Uh, since the supply of land is fixed, taxing it won't decrease the amount of land that's available. Um, uh, but I'll be, since those efficiency arguments are very well understood among economists, I'm going to instead focus uh, in this talk on the on George's justice based arguments for a land value tax. So uh, now we need to examine, I think, the connection between natural resources and self ownership and really dig into this claim that I made, I've made a couple of times that Locke thinks that um, rights to strong property rights and natural resources follow from our self ownership and in particular of our capacity to labor on those natural resources. But George thinks that private appropriation of natural resources is inconsistent with self ownership. Uh, and that's because he thinks that self ownership requires a certain kind of access to natural resources. We can't be self owners unless we have access to natural resources in a sense that I'll uh, try to specify. Um, for one, uh, just note that um, the human body is not a, a system that exists in isolation of the external physical world. We have to eat and drink and breathe in order to survive. So those causal interactions with the physical world are uh, necessary to our persistence over time. And indeed, even the fact that we're occupying space in the world uh, is using a kind of uh, uh, land. So self-ownership is, um, is not possible without uh, use of natural resources. Um, so, I mean, not only is self-ownership required for basic biological biological functions like eating, drinking, and breathing, and merely existing. Uh, it's also required for uh, all valuable human activities, so both production and consumption. Um, in order to produce anything of value, you have to use uh, uh, land, which is one of the basic factors of production for George, um, uh, in addition to your labor. Um, so, uh, Merely existing requires land, uh, but also doing any any valuable activity requires land as well. So our rights as self owners would be completely worthless um, uh, if we didn't also have natural access to natural resources and a certain kind of protected access to natural resources. <clears throat> George offers us a thought experiment that um, I think uh, allows us to um take a first step to identify what kind of natural resources what kind of access to natural resources is required by our self-ownership uh because it allows us to see what goes wrong in cases where access to natural resources is absent so he offers us this nice thought experiment in i believe it's book seven chapter two of progress and poverty um i omitted to put the uh exact reference on the slide but i'll go ahead and read you the quote <clears throat> Place 100 men on an island from which there's no escape, and whether you make uh, one of these men the absolute owner of the other 99 or the absolute owner of the soil of the island will make no difference either to him or to them. In the one case as in the other, the one will be the absolute master of the 99, his power extending even to life and death for simply to refuse to them permission to live on the island uh, would be to force them into the sea. So... <clears throat> This thought experiment, what this thought experiment shows, I think, is that um, the islanders clearly don't have the kind of access to natural resources that they would require, that they require as self-owners. Um, indeed, their condition is no better than slavery because uh, their access to natural resources is conditioned upon the will of someone else uh, that is the owner of the island. And I don't think this thought experiment is just uh, some kind of abstract philosopher's trick. Uh, I. Instead, later on in the chapter where this thought experiment occurs, George thought, comments extensively on uh, the failure of emancipation to truly free formerly enslaved people in the American South, uh, because there wasn't land reform that was concurrent with uh, emancipation. So the large plantation owners continued to uh, own their plantations, and that's what enabled a system of sharecropping uh, uh, to persist 
uh, after the emancipation and the end of slavery. And that system of sharecropping uh, uh, left the formerly enslaved people uh, only marginally better off in some cases than um, than they were previously. So um, that's sort of uh, what George is thinking about when he's offering this island thought experiment. And I think it successfully shows that people have to have certain kinds of access to natural resources in order for them to exercise their rights as self-owners. And if they don't have that access, then they uh, are being oppressed in some respect by the people who do own natural resources. <clears throat> so uh, what I think the ultimate conclusion, uh, or, or one, I, I should say one interesting theoretical upshot of this discussion is that um, some people often characterize Georgism as the view that uh, there's two fundamental premises for distributive justice. One is about our self-ownership uh, and the other is about giving us equal access to natural resources. But I think uh, the second premise actually follows from the first premise. I don't think we need any uh, claim, any independent claims about equal access to natural resources. All of those, uh, the fact that we all deserve equal access to natural resources just follows from our equal rights as self-owners. It's not an independent further claim that we need to make uh, uh, to establish a Georgist view of distributive justice. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about this connection between um, self-ownership and natural resources. Uh, and in particular, now focusing on the labor connection. So what I'll argue now is that um, if natural resources are privately owned, George thinks, then laborers will not enjoy the full products of their labor. Rather, uh, the people who own natural resources will be able to extract something like surplus value from uh, the laborers. And I'll just read this quote to introduce you to that idea. The right of ownership that springs from labor excludes the possibility of any other right of ownership. If a man be rightfully entitled to the produce of his labor, then no one can be rightfully entitled to the ownership of anything which is not the produce of his labor. If production give to the, presume, the producer the right to exclusive possession and enjoyment, uh, there can rightfully be no exclusive possession and enjoyment of anything not the production of labor. And the recognition of private property and land is a wrong. For the right to the produce of labor cannot be enjoyed without the right uh, to the free use of uh, opportunities offered by nature and to admit the right of property in these is to deny the right of property in the produce of labor. When non-producers can claim as rent a portion of the wealth created by producers, the right to the producers the right of the producers to the fruits of their labor is to that extent denied. <clears throat> so um, now what I wanna do is try to reconstruct this argument uh, as precisely as I can um, uh, in the form of four premises and a conclusion. So I'll just read out this argument and then I'll say a little bit about each premise. First premise, in order to produce anything, one needs to use natural resources. If natural resources are privately owned, then producers must, must purchase permission to use natural resources from private owners. If, pro if producers must purchase permission to use natural resources from private owners, then they will not get to keep all of the value that they produce. And the final premise, since we are self-owners, uh, uh, producers are entitled to the value they produce. <clears throat> and the conclusion that follows from these premises is that if natural resources are privately owned, then producers will not get what they are entitled to as self-owners. Private appropriation of natural resources is inconsistent with self-ownership. <coughs> so let me say a little bit about each of these premises. I said a little bit about premise one before, in order to produce anything, one needs to use natural resources. Uh, that's because land is one of the three fundamental uh, factors of production, along with labor and capital. It might seem like this, this idea of land, labor, and capital as um, three independent factors of production is no longer appropriate, given that, the not, given that the economy is now a knowledge economy rather than an industrial or agricultural economy. And uh, the idea is, well, we needed land to uh, grow the crops. Uh, uh, 
that fueled the economy. But that role is now marginalized, and most of the uh, economic activity surrounds the production and use of knowledge. And I don't think that's quite right, just because um, most of the valuable intellectual property uh, that exists gets produced in one of a few knowledge hubs uh, in the world, like Boston, San Francisco, New York, uh, the other leading cities. Um, and the people who produce that knowledge have to pay very high urban land rents in order to access the uh, uh, valuable collaboration and innovation ecosystems uh, that exist in those cities. So I think land is as important to the production process today, the production of knowledge as it ever was uh, uh, in previous eras that were based on agriculture or industry. <clears throat> I think the second and third premises are pretty self-explanatory. Um, premise two just characterizes uh, a state in which um, uh, all private, all, all resources that are valuable to use in production have been appropriated. Um, uh, premise four, I should say, rather than premise three. three. I think premise four is um, uh, self-explanatory as well. I think a lot of the action uh, is in premise three. So, um, uh, the idea here is that if you have to pay another person to have access to natural resources that you use to produce valuable goods and services, then that other person who is entitled, not, not entitled, but who possesses the right to those natural resources is able to extract some of the value that you produce in an illegitimate way. Um, and I think this idea is best explained um, uh, side by side with Marx's idea of surplus value. Um, Marx thought that capitalists exploit uh, laborers because um, uh, everyone has to use both land and capital in production and the owners of capital can extract the surplus value from the laborers uh, in exchange for access to the means of production. What Marx didn't realize is that there's an important difference between land and capital. There are two very different factors of production and uh, having to pay someone else for access to land, George Riley shows us why that's illegitimate. No one made the land and the value of the land is determined in this holistic uh, social way. But uh, access to capital, if you have to pay someone else for access to capital, I don't think that's uh, nearly as questionable uh, in terms of the legitimacy of that practice. I think uh, there's an important difference there between land and capital that Marx doesn't pick up on, but George does. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, so that's the, that's how I'm reconstructing George's argument um, uh, that private ownership of land leads to the illegitimate extraction of uh, surplus value and is therefore inconsistent with self-ownership. <clears throat> I want to say just a little bit about um, what I think this view implies about the just distribution of land rents. Um, and a lot of this argument gets uh, uh, very technical and into the weeds in the literature on distributive justice. So I'm just gonna, for the purposes of this talk, try to characterize it at a higher level. Uh, so basically there's two kinds of views about how we ought to distribute land rents that can be motivated from a Georgist perspective. The first is <clears throat> an egalitarian view. Um, so the thought here is that, uh, well, since everyone has, everyone's equally entitled to access natural resources, what we should do is simply add up, uh, the, the annual rental values for all the natural resources in the world, and then divide it by the size of the global population and give everybody a, a universal basic income funded by natural resource rents. And that would respect their equal rights as self-owners. I don't think that view is correct, um, simply because um, people don't equally contribute to the creation of natural resource rents. So if we think about urban land in particular, we can see why that is. Um, the value of urban land is determined in large part by the productive activities of people who live in the city and the valuable infrastructure investments that have been made by the local government. Um, so. I think the idea that we ought to um, include the rents for urban land into this global universal basic income is not right simply because 
people on the other side of the world don't have any entitlement to the urban land value that's created by uh, the hard work of people who live in some particular city. Um, so I think the uh, egalitarian and cosmopolitan dimension of that view won't work just simply in light of the the facts about how urban land is gets its value in the first place. Um, and so instead, I favor something like a proportional view that I'm happy to elaborate on uh, in the Q&A period. Um, on this view, we want to give natural resources, give natural resource rents to people in proportion to their contribution to creating those natural resource rents in the first place. So this would imply, for instance, that we ought to um, uh, use the rents from urban land largely to fund the local amenities uh, in the city uh, in question. So uh, in the last few minutes before I conclude, I want to talk about one, uh, one future direction of research for me and where this research program is going. Um, and I think that's uh, uh, to highlight an important connection I see between the thought of Henry George and uh, one of his contemporary, contemporaries, Thorstein Veblen. Uh, so you see Veblen here pictured on the left, um, uh, looking very leisurely, uh, I might add. Uh, this is a photograph from the Yale Sociology Department. Um, uh, Veblen did his PhD at Yale back in the 1880s. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues sent me this nice uh, portrait of him that's hanging there today. So some of you might know of Veblen from his uh, book called Theory of the Leisure Class, in which he argued uh, that well, first he introduced the idea of conspicuous consumption and conspicuous leisure. Uh, a lot of our consumption practices are driven by purely by waste. So uh, people buy things that are way too expensive simply to uh, signal that they have resources uh, to spare and that a lot of waste gets generated by the consumption process. Um, uh, using more modern vocabulary that Dublin didn't use, uh, a lot of goods are positional goods. That is, um, the formal definition of a positional good is it's a good whose utility to the consumer who consumes it is not determined entirely by the intrinsic features of the good, but rather by um, how that good compares to the goods that are consumed by other people. So think about something like uh, mega yachts, for instance. Um, those are mostly positional goods because uh, having a much, much bigger yacht isn't the intrinsic properties of having a much bigger yacht are not that much better than the intrinsic properties of a smaller but still massive yacht. What's in, why people spend all this money on larger and larger yachts is simply to have bigger yachts than other people, right? Uh, it's not for the intrinsic uh, qualities that the yacht has. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Veblen's account of positional consumption holds that um, uh, people in modern commercial societies have very strong and very deep preferences for positional goods, and they spend a lot of their money trying to secure such goods. Um, uh, and it goes beyond just the yacht example. There are many more. Um, I, the interesting feature of positional goods from a Georgist perspective is that they have land-like properties. So um, the essential feature of land is that nobody can make any more land uh, and nobody made the land in the first place. Uh, so a tax on land is not distortionary for that reason. Positional goods are the same way. So sort of by definition, no one can make there be uh, two largest yachts uh, that exist. That's just a contradiction in terms. Um, so the race for positional goods sort of has some of the same dynamics as uh, land. I think the central problematic for George and Veblen is both is the same in both cases. They both are interested in why um, there's so much uh, inequality and continued poverty alongside progress, even though there's been a lot of economic growth and technological progress uh, in the second half of the 19th century. Um, and they give, I think, superficially dissimilar answers to this question. George thinks that um, economic growth doesn't benefit people to the extent that it should because of the way that land is owned. Um, 
And Veblen, on the other hand, thinks that it's because people, uh, when they get increased purchasing power, simply waste it on positional goods. But these are, in fact, just aspects of the same explanation. Uh, because positional goods have this land-like characteristic uh, that they're fixed in supply. Um, and so when you have a group of people, all of whom have preferences to have some good that's fixed in supply, and you have an exogenous increase in the amount of purchasing power that's available due to economic growth and technological progress, people will just spend money to bid up the price of those goods. Um, and that will result in waste uh, in both the case of land and in the case of positional goods. Uh, so both have this sort of arms race characteristic. And of course, George's solution to this is to tax land. And what that does is it forces us to use the existing land more efficiently. So we build taller buildings so that more people can have access to the same location when multiple people want to use the same location. Um, I think in virtue of the structural similarity between positional goods and land, um, uh, a tax on conspicuous consumption, which we might implement in a number of different ways, would have the same virtues as a tax on land value. Um, so this is, uh, this is a parallel that I want to explore more in my future work, um, but I've just uh, on this slide laid out the basics of the argument. Since um, positional goods have these land-like characteristics, namely that they're fixed in supply, um, uh, taxes on positional goods have the same virtues as land value taxes. So we should see an important similarity between these two figures uh, George and Veblen, I think, are arguably the two leading social critics of the Gilded Age. Uh, Progress and Poverty, of course, coming out uh, in 1879, and Theory of the Leisure Class coming out in 1899, which is 20 years apart. And I think they're responding to some of the same problems, and um, uh, there's an unappreciated uh, symmetry between their two main ideas. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this talk.